HVDC connections. The funding for the project was provided by the Innovation Fund Denmark Grand Solutions. The key partners were EnergyNet, Hitachi ABB and KTH. The project had a budget of about three and a half million euros and has been going for almost full five years now. Um, and also just to flag that there will be an in-person session as well. So on the 28th of October, um, actually at TUD, uh, at, at the Lingby campus in Denmark, there is a, a physical event uh, happening. So just to make you all aware of that, and the registration is at the, the slide there. So enough of the intro. I will stop sharing my screen now so that the first actual presenter can get going and I'll just introduce them as they get sorted. Well, so our first presenter today is uh, Laudra Stahl from EnergyNet. He's a power system engineer in the grid analysis department at EnergyNet, uh, the transmission system operator of Denmark. He's been working with power system model and stability analysis and has been involved in the North Sea Wind Power Hub and is also acting as the project manager for electrical system analysis in the Danish Energy Islands project. So with no further ado, I'll be quiet and hand over. Thank you. Thank you, Ian. Thank you so much. I hope everyone hears me clear. Let me share the screen. There we go. I hope you see my screen now at least. So uh, thank you very much for giving the opportunity to present here. I'll be presenting on the use of real-time simulation for feasibility studies related to the Dan Danish Energy Island project and the North Sea uh, Wind Power Hub. So let's see here. So I will get into some of the technical challenges and the simulation needs when we want to construct these uh, large offshore hybrid grids and uh, how real-time simulation can be used for de-risking and the role of real-time simulation in this. So in Denmark, uh, we currently have uh, political plans and are doing a lot of studies and analysis on how it can be done to construct two energy islands. One island will be located in the North Sea, and in the first step, we need to connect three gigawatts of offshore wind to this hub, uh, and it should be expandable up to 10 gigawatts. Um, and then we have the second energy island, which is uh, located on the Bornholm Island in the Baltic Sea, where we need to connect, uh, connect two gigawatts of offshore wind by year 2030. And these energy islands should also have uh, interconnectors to other countries, uh, it could be Germany for the Bornholm Energy Island, but also in the North Sea, it could be the Netherlands, Belgium and uh, Germany, but also other options are investigated. So if you think about these energy islands, uh, what we like to call them at Energinet is that they are kind of like the extreme version of the future uh, inverter-based power system. So if you look at this figure I'm showing on the, on the right side, we have the traditional Danish power system as, as it is today. We already have a lot of HVDC and wind power in this system, but uh, we also still have a lot of synchronous machines. And in Denmark, we are so fortunate that we have strong interconnectors, AC interconnectors to both Germany and the continental Europe, but also to Sweden in, uh, in Shellen, which helps our stability and gives inertia to the system. Now, looking at the energy island, we will be coupling uh, HVDC and wind power and probably also uh, future power to gas systems offshore in this very tightly coupled offshore system with no inertia and only power electronics. So what we are going to discuss today is how can real-time simulation, can it be used to de-risk this type of sy uh, systems and, and in what aspects? So, these, constructing these energy islands is a very different uh, type of uh, grid integration than we're normally doing in Denmark up on, until this point. Up until this point in Denmark, we have only been integrating, you could say, uh, wind power by AC connections uh, to a POC, which could be either offshore or onshore. And uh, you could say this is very much based on the classical methods. Uh, the wind power plant owner is just giving a seven an equivalent that they have to do all their compliance testing against. 
and we have the requirement for generators with very specific requirements for this. Now, if we consider the energy island, we will be trying out something completely new that we have no experience in doing, and uh, which also calls for a lot of new development uh, in how do we de-risk this type of system. So with the energy islands that I just showed, we want to have a system that can be expanded over time. So we may want to start with one uh, offshore wind uh, power plant and then interconnecting with HVDC and then gradually expand. You're uh, seeing here three expansion stages, but there's also a high chance and we also uh, seek that this should be possible, that this will be a multi-vendor environment uh, so that we need to be able to connect uh, HVDC systems, wind power plants from different wind turbine uh, owner, uh, uh, manufacturers and also different uh, vendors of HVDC together. So this is a completely new uh, challenge for us. Uh, also, we need to make sure that we have the sufficient stability, that we have control and stability in the offshore grid, uh, both on the DC side, if we should go for multi-terminal DC, but also on the AC side. And here there are many big questions that still needs to be answered. Uh, how about the grid forming control? How should this be designed? How do we set the voltage and the frequency offshore? Should it primarily be the grid forming control from the HVDC plants? Or should we also consider some grid forming control uh, capability from the wind turbines. Would it be cheaper, easier? This is also something that has been studied and analyzed, ana analyzed in the multi-DC project. Would it be beneficial to install synchronous compensators offshores? What about batteries and how does offshore power to gas, which we want to connect eventually to the system, how would this impact everything? So we have to really uh, think about the system uh, how should we specify it? How do we make sure we have stability offshore uh, in this uh, low, uh, low strength, no inertia system? So we want to achieve a system that we can modularly expand without having to reconfigure and retune every control system every time we add a new HVDC or new wind part, power plant. So at a, in Aguina, we talk about having this modularity of the design. So what is modularity really? Uh, of course, you need to think about the substation design. You need to have the right number of bus bars. You need to have uh, everything, the base of the bus uh, substation ready so they can connect new systems. But you also need to have this interoperability, multi-vendor interoperability to succeed. And then finally, in the, in the bottom of the figure is shown that this is not only a power system engineer or engineering problem, it's also very much a legal problem of making multiple vendors work together. So we have to do studies, we have to do uh, prepare material to, to tender this system and to specify the system. And uh, you could divide this into different phases where you need to do studies. You have a feasibility phase, you have a specification phase, an implementation uh, phase, and then an operational phase. But the big problem here, one of the challenges is that you don't know the vendors. You don't have any vendor specific models uh, until you have awarded the contracts and you are in, in this implementation phase. So up, all the way up until this point, while you're in the feasibility phase and the specification phase, at least for the first step, you have to do this with purely generic material, generic models, because there's nothing there yet. Um, and, and this is also one of the topics today that we need to discuss is there a role for uh, real-time simulation uh, and hardware in the loop simulation in a generic environment? But also then as soon as you have the first system installed and you are adding on and expanding, what is the role then? One of the big tricky thing, if we consider this specification phase, is that uh, we want to construct something completely new, something that there are no standards for. It has not been tried before. So uh, NSOE uh, have published a paper for offshore development where they talk about this vicious cycle. And this is a tricky situation that many system operators who have to build these systems find ourselves in at the moment where we get stuck in this loop because uh, we don't know how to specify these systems because we don't know what is possible. And the manufacturers, they are asking uh, what, what are the requirements so that they can construct the systems for us. And then we'll get stuck in this vicious loop. 
so if we really want to think about designing this future proof system, uh, we need to think about the full chain of the technical solution. We don't, it's not only about the component layer that we have down here, where we have some grid, some wind turbines, some HVDC, but we really have to think all the way through, uh, all the way up to the organizational layer, the legal framework, everything. And then we have the specifications. And then again, here comes the interesting question. What is the role of uh, real-time simulation in all of this? Can we use it to make specifications of these future systems? So what is the role really of these uh, simulation tools? Now, if we want to consider that our goal is to achieve something like this, uh, an off where we can connect different offshore hubs. Uh, uh, you see here an offshore A and an offshore B, and uh, here you have uh, eight gigawatts of wind at different sites, and then this is interconnected to different points of the European system. Now here I'm showing it in a multi-DC system. So what we could do to de-risk this is to buy a replica system of the first system. Now we cannot really do much with the hardware in the loop in this with the replica at this point in time because we just have this one system. But as we expand, we could go into a, a larger setup if we wanted to construct a connection to Belgium. We could go into a laboratory with the, and do real-time testing to de-risk with replicas of each system. And further on, as we expand, maybe we will have a Dutch hub here with a connection to the Netherlands and maybe to uh, Great Britain. We could then finally set everything up in a laboratory again and interconnect everything to de-risk. So this is the sort of thinking we have right now uh, at Ineginet. What is possible? What is needed? What should we do? So the reflections that we could make is uh, maybe a real-time simulation can be used in order to, uh, to simulate these large grids. At Eneginet, we're considering if control and protection replicas should be used, uh, should be purchased for the first systems in order to later be, uh, be able to use them for real-time hardware in the loop simulation. But it's also an open question for us if uh, doing real-time simulation with generic models for feasibility studies in the first early phases really create any values. And this is one of the open questions. So that, that was it for my introductory uh, uh, presentation here. So thank you very much for listening. Thank you, perfectly timed in the 10 minutes as well. Uh, so just while Matas gets himself sharing his screen, I'll just briefly introduce him. Um, he is a research assistant within the multi-DC project led by DTU. He's working in the field of power system modeling, in particular, the Nordic power system and conceptual models of the North Sea Wind Power Hub with offline and real-time simulation tools. So over to you, Matas. Thank you. Thank you. Are you able to see the screen? Yes. Great. Um, so welcome to the presentation about uh, multi-DC studies with real-time simulations uh, in feasibility stage. Uh, during the presentation, we'll discuss the topology of the case, uh, the, the North Sea Wind Power Hub case, uh, the motivation uh, to use real-time simulations at early project stage with a large number of power electronic devices, will provide a simulation comparison between uh, real-time and offline simulations where we discuss uh, advantages and uh, disadvantages of uh, real-time simulations. Uh, next, uh, we'll present the ongoing work um, on a hardware in the loop implementation in Power Lab Decay and how this can improve further the feasibility studies. And we will conclude the presentation uh, with key takeaways. So um, to increase the generation from carbon-free sources, uh, the vision emerged a few years ago to install uh, 12 to 36 gigawatts of wind power by building multiple energy islands in the North Sea. Um, for the following project studies, we are focusing on the uh, first devel development stage. So a single expandable offshore energy island model. Uh, and this model, um, contains uh, two point-to-point -point HUD CVC interconnectors and five lumped uh, wind power plant representations. Uh, 
uh, with different cable length uh, to account uh, for the position around the um, around the island. And this particular setup uh, could be um, expanded uh, using uh, connecting ca connecting cables between other hubs, um, as shown uh, with these uh, with these connections here. Um, due to current technological limitations of the DC technology, in particular um, high voltage uh, DC breakers, uh, we have considered so far we have considered uh, AC hub con configuration uh, with two different uh, topology designs. Uh, zero inertia topology. Mm, this is 100% power electronic um, power electronic uh, system uh, with grid forming uh, converters uh, uh, for the uh, yeah for the offshore con converters, which uh, control and set a reference uh, for hub voltage and frequency. And the second case, uh, low inertia topology, which has additional element, a synchronous condenser connected to the hub to utilize its rotational energy. And the offshore converters can be operated in grid uh, following mode uh, to support the hub voltage and frequency. So the typical project development process is presented in the figure. Uh, with each project phase, the modeling uh, complexity increases. At, the, at early stages, for example, feasibility studies, uh, we focus on conceptual design, uh, often use generic models and often run uh, RMS, uh, RMS simulations and deal with trial and error type of simulations. If you go to tender and detailed design phases, uh, we shift to offline EMP studies uh, with detailed equipment control and uh, real-time uh, simulations being used for factory acceptance tests and commissioning phases uh, using uh, control and protection replicas. However, in, the, in, in such an offshore system with large number of power electronic devices, short-term and long-term stability phenomena are no longer decoupled um, due, to the v, due to the V grid. So we need a new tool that could cover simulations from milliseconds to minutes with the same accuracy as EMT. And currently, RMS tools cannot capture fast transients and the offline EMT tools uh, are not sufficient for long-term simulations due to excessive computation times. So we need new ways uh, or new practices to simulate such power systems. And to represent such system in feasibility studies, we often look at sequential simulations where high accuracy and immediate feedback is needed. And uh, for, trial, for trial and error simulations, uh, RTS uh, could be a solution. Mm, so real-time simulations are executed in, in real time where one simulation second equals uh, one uh, second uh, according real-time clock. And the power system response is uh, immediately presented using uh, interactive displays, uh, such as uh, given in the figure. And this is very con convenient when you're running trial and error simulation to immediately see the outcome of uh, or the power system response uh, after, after a certain action. Uh, and this real-time capability is maintained independent of the model size uh, or complexity of the model. And due to that, uh, it allows us to consider more detailed uh, system representations in, in real-time simulations without increasing computational time at all, such as uh, more exact uh, transmission cable modelings, uh, include switching phenomena of the converters and perform simulations at reduced time step. And even with the reduced complexity, our offline EMT model takes about 20 to 28 times longer than RTS uh, using average computer. In this slide, uh, we present two cases to show comparison between um, RTS and offline simulations. Uh, on the left graph, you can see the hub voltage. On the right ones, uh, you can see the hub frequency. So, more detailed uh, representation in RTS uh, and, and small simulation time step allows greater simulation depth. Uh, in the first case, uh, RTS can capture fast transients uh, and harmonic content from switching. And for certain cases, identify different instabilities when offline EMP fails to do so. 
Um, however, RTS has some, some limitations and uh, the, the most obvious one, high investment cost of the hardware and infrastructure as seen in the figure above. Uh, it requires a dedicated, uh, dedicated room for that. Uh, it, ha it, it has additional resources in terms of IT and technicians to make the necessary connections and uh, supervision of the equipment. And the hardware restricts uh, the model size um, to meet real-time clock condition. Uh, and due to that, uh, some simplifications of, of the system may be needed. Uh, so for example, a part of a network uh, uh, maybe uh, needs to be represented with uh, equivalent, uh, equivalent grid. However, this hardware and real-time operation gives unique advantage to RTS, um, ability to connect physical devices uh, to a simulation environment. And this is done by um, exchanging input and output signals uh, in real-time with uh, communication protocols. Uh, in multi-DC uh, case study, the device under test uh, is a black box uh, synchronous condenser AVR control located in this uh, cabinet here. Uh, and in this setup, the output signals uh, are transferred from the software model to the uh, amplifier and finally to the uh, hardware in the loop AVR, where the signals are then processed. Virtual machine um, uh, simulates the AVR response and then issues back a feedback signal to the simulation environment. And in our view, this can further improve uh, feasibility studies in, in two ways. Uh, the first one, uh, validate our simulation model according hardware in the loop. Mm, in this case, uh, we tune AVR to a software model and analyze the response with uh, embedded limits uh, in, in hardware in the loop. Uh, and this, uh, this lets us to consider certain control functions like uh, over-excitation, under-excitation, uh, et cetera, and, and other simulation sequences su such as start, uh, start up or shutdown of, of, of the machine. And the second way is uh, to create a digital twin uh, by calibrating our RTS software model according hardware in the loop. Um, in this way, we match our uh, AVR simulation response to hardware in the loop. Uh, and in, by doing so, we simplify simulation setup and provide more flexibility to change the simulation environment while assessing different control parameters. So um, what are the main takeaways? Um, from our brief interaction with RTS, we can conclude that Increasing number of power electronic devices require ac accurate and fast uh, modeling solutions. And we believe that RTS has qualities which could be applied in, in feasibility stage. Uh, when we compared offline and RTS, we observed increased simulation accuracy um, while maintaining same simulation performance, which is very useful uh, when we deal with sequential simulations. Mm, and RTS can accommodate uh, connection of uh, physical devices. And this uh, could be uh, a real time saver uh, when we design our control, uh, our control models. Uh, so that's about it. Uh, thank you for, for listening. Are there any questions? Thank you, Matas, and thank you for the questions as well. There's a few come in, but if anyone does have any questions, there's a Q&A function. So if you hover over the bottom of your Zoom thing, uh, you should see the Q&A uh, box. And if you click that, you'll be able to submit questions and we'll try and address as many of them as we can at the end. Uh, so I will um, just introduce our next speaker, Sebastian from RTE, where he uh, gets his, his screen share on the go. So Sebastian is a power systems expert. He works for RTE and RTE International in the field of EMT simulation and integration of power electronic based devices and transmission grids. So without any further ado, on you go, Sebastian. Thank you. Good. Do you see my screen? Yep. Hello. Perfect. Yep. Okay, good. So good afternoon, everybody. 
Um, so I will present today experiences we have at RT and RT International with real-time simulation for converter-dominated-based uh, system, uh, but also some ideas concerning ongoing challenges with this type of tools. Um, as already discussed and, and presented by Matas, two different types of EMT tools are available. The offline tools that can solve system equations faster and slower than real-time clock, and the calculation speed depend on complexity of the system. And real-time tools that can solve system equation synchronize with the real-time clock. The major benefit of real-time simulation is its capability to interface physical devices to the simulation. And this is what we call hardware in the loop simulation. But it comes with uh, some limitation, obviously. And to be able to solve the system equation synchronized with the real-time clock, Powerful computers are required, but also several simplification are required. And both offline and real-time simulation tools are intensively used uh, in our company. And I just would like to introduce or to illustrate the use of hardware in the loop simulation and EMT studies uh, that we use to conduct uh, with offline and real-time simulation. So um, we have a new facility that has been opened this year uh, in Lyon, in the, in the middle of France here, or in the south. Uh, this is a new campus that gather a training center and a real-time lab. Uh, we have uh, around 30 experts in the field of HVDC and integration of, of renewable uh, that uh, presently work on, in this campus. Um, for the control protection replica, as we are uh, mentioning this uh, in, during this webinar, we have 15 sets of, of um, uh, control protection replica for a total of around 200 uh, physical cubicles for projects in France and abroad. So this is why a new facility has been built to host all these replicas. So how do we in the loop? Uh, with physical replica is used at RT and RT International for different applications. It is used at different phases of a project to perform dynamic studies, but also train operation and maintenance teams on the hardware and software. So you can see here um, control protection replica setup for the IPA2 interconnector. This is a 1000 megawatt VSC HVDC link between France and UK that has been commissioned end of last year. Um, this replica is composed of 80 um, control protection cubicles installed in a dedicated room. This is the figure on the top uh, right. And next to this room, all the HMI uh, of the HVDC system are installed and in a, a dedicated room. And the real-time simulator is also controlled from this room. And this is very typical uh, setup for hardware in the loop uh, simulation. And then another typical setup is the UN Vero project. This project concerns electrical connection of offshore platform with two HVDC links from two different vendors. And for this setup, we have three separated rooms, one for uh, one manufacturer, ABB, one for Siemens and, uh, and Kongsberg, uh, which uh, is the vendor for the SCADA system, um, and one for to control the overall system. And this is a large and complex system, very useful to analyze interoperability between the two technologies from two different vendors. But then, um, as you can see, we have invested a lot in hardware in the loop simulation and real-time simulation. It's clearly a strategic tool to de-risk HVDC schemes because control protection replica provide very important and additional features compared with offline simulation. First, the control protection system are accurately represented because these are the real hardware and software used in the simulation loop. One of the benefits is also accessibility and flexibility compared with the black box offline models provided by vendors. I mean that when you have a replica, some part of the control logic may be accessible with the replica. It's also useful, it has been already mentioned, when you have low frequency phenomena that shall be analyzed compared with offline models. And it's also facilitate the analysis of multi-vendor, multi-technology system, because the control protection software run at different time step on their own hardware. But hardware in the loop simulation and real-time simulation is not magic tool. It comes with many limitations. First, as already mentioned, it requires investment in hardware, infrastructure, and resources. But what is also important is that there are also many simplifications that are needed to fulfill the real-time constraint. 
they can, and they can highly impact the accuracy of the result. So the treatment of non-linearities non is more limited than in offline simulation. The real-time simulator have usually uh, limited capability to extend the frequency range of validity due to the time step limitation. And in specific conditions, the zero sequence impedance modeling may be difficult due to the subline or fictitious transmission line that are used to decouple the network solution. And this is why a substantial part of our resources is dedicated to validation and quality control of hardware and loop simulation. So for each hardware and loop setup, regular benchmarking between offline simulation and real-time simulation are performed. It's a complex task to identify limitation in the real-time simulation, their impact and possible solution to increase the accuracy. And so the real-time simulation is a relevant solution to the risk HVDC uh, project with complex and um, control protection system, only because real physical hardware can be inserted into the simulation loop. So it's clearly not a relevant solution if, there, if no hardware is connected to um, the simulator. And we think it's a nonsense to use real-time simulation without any hardware. So with, for instance, only control protection mo uh, models, just with the objectives to speed up the EMT simulation. So there are more and more initiatives that promote use of real-time simulation to analyze development of converter-dominated large-scale system. And then we can raise the question if this is the only suitable solution to the risk such project, even if hardware and the loop simulation provide important benefits. Offline EMT simulation remain essential because first, it can include more detailed and accurate representation of the electrical equipment. It is possible to automatically run thousands of simulation without any human action, which is more difficult when a real control protection system is involved. You have some uh, to acknowledge, for instance, when you have a trip of an address system, you have to acknowledge you need a manual action or what you can do is to modify the control software in order to um, uh, disable some function like that. But in this case, you need to modify the, uh, the, the system. You, with the offline, you, there is no need to adapt model to facilitate real-time speed. And it will require fewer human resources and hardware in the loop with physical replicas. This is why, from our experience, the development of large-scale grid cannot rely only on hardware and the loop simulation. It shall be a mix of both simulation tools. We always hear that offline simulation is slow, but this is not true. It can be fast when robust and efficient numerical methods are used. Um, there are also new opportunities offered by parallel computing. Uh, to split the solution of complex grid and run large number of scenario in parallel. So here it's an example of a large grid um, uh, for, that is uh, implemented and used in the offline uh, simulation to the MTP. This is the French transmission grid that is assembled in the user interface and used every day by our engineers who perform studies. And large EMT studies are it's already possible. Obviously, even if EMT offline simulation can be performed of large scale system, some improvement are needed in the future. First, on the model provided by vendors. A few items are listed here. There are some work still required to facilitate interoperability of models from different vendors. For instance, standardization of code interfaces. Uh, done some initiative done at, uh, in the SIGRE working group before 82, and use of DLL approach rather than LEAP approach. We also need to standardize the accessibility of data and models, especially for electrical equipment. And then models should be designed to, val um, to be valid for different time steps. They should also use different representation of the control protection hardware. That means that to include delays, time response, and it's not done by all the vendors. And second, we also need a new generation of EMT offline tools to improve numerical techniques, to improve, to have better accuracy, better simulation speed, better handling also of large amount of data, data standardization to facilitate data exchange, and then the possibility to access remotely to an EMT offline large scale model with restricted access of some part. For instance, large green model with different wind farms and HVDC vendor 
that would access only to their equipment. It would be a similar setup than the one we presently use for the UN Turtle project. So just to conclude with this presentation, I would just would like to say that real-time simulation is very useful to the risk converter nominated large scale system when it is used to do hardware in the loop studies. And it comes to complement TMT offline, not to replace it. And in the coming years, even if some improvement in offline EMT simulation are required, it will most probably take more importance in the future. Thank you. Thank you very much. And yeah, once again, just if you have any questions for Sebastian, please put them in the Q&A and we'll, we'll try and address them at the end. And just while our final presenter uh, starts to share his screen, I'll just give his brief introduction. So we have Robert Johansson. He is a senior test engineer at the Control and Protection Department at Hitachi Power Grids. He works in the tender team, is responsible for the areas of real-time testing and replicas. And prior to that, he worked as a simulator and commissioning engineer for 15 years. So thank you, and I'll hand over to you. Can you see my screen? Yep, perfect. Good. So I will talk about the real-time simulation at Hitachi ABB. I will also move uh, talk a little bit about how we do code development in our projects. So the, what we're talking about, brief history of real-time simulation at Hitachi ABB. Code development during project execution. Real-time simulation in projects with RFST, factory system test. Benefits and drawbacks of real-time simulation and the future of real-time simulation. So the brief history of simulation, real-time simulation at Hitachi ABB. We started with analog simulators, both for factory testing and studies. And mid nineties, we actually split, we introduced PSCAD, but we were still using the analog simulator for the FST studies, the FST running. Uh, at that time, we also purchased the first RTDS, but that wasn't used for real project until 2005, when we started using it for line commutated converters. And in 2008, we started with the first VSC project with the RTDS. At that time, we also introduced the VMAC system for PSCAD studies. The performance guarantee chain, how we do development of the code here at Hitachi. We have the RMS test with upper level control design for stability studies with a network model, fast calculations, EMT tests, lower level control design, transient studies, reduced AC network, slow calculations. This is the control design and verification. Then we have our factory test, control implementation, hardware test, AC equivalent, usually single source, real time, and then we go to site, as you can see, real time. <laughs> control, this is for control integration and testing. So we actually have a quite good split between the studies and the testing of these systems. From base design to customize project solutions, our virtual control design for dynamic performance. This is what we start with, the customer input, technical specification and network data. That goes into our base design and we get the control system design and the main circuit design. The network data gives us a network equivalent. We get out of these three, we built a simulation model. We run our studies and the feedback goes in the control system, back to the simulator model and so on. So there are some overturning here to get a complete system. Once this is done, we move to the actual system and implement it in the real hardware for the factor system test. Why FST? Why do we do the factor system test? This is to test the real and complete HVDC control and protection system as one unit. It's a system test. This is where we can test the whole system before we deliver it. And also this is where we have the customer, uh, customer review of our testing and 
or hardware. What we are testing in the FSD and where we in the when we get the cubic, we have a testing on green line of the control and protection cubicles at first. At that time, we also do the testing of our real time models and the interfaces against the control and the simulator. Then we have a, the, the verification of code implementation. And also, we can then do in the real time, we can see that they can control the simulation, the breakers and disconnector response, tap changers, also that all the measuring the values comes from the real time simulator into the control system as it should. Then the te real testing of the system stored, functional test of the complete CMP system. The real time is only used then for fault initiation. It just runs. Once we are in this, uh, this place, we are running 24 seven with the control system and the simulators. Then we move into real time model. What are we representing? Main circuit equipment, valve control, valve transformer, DC line, DC cables. These are detail modeled. We are using almost all, all real time alert ADS real standard library for these ones. AC network. In the FSD, we use a single source. I will come back to that in the next slide. Essential breakers and disconnectors is in the model with timing. Non essential disconnectors and grounding switches, usually with external relays. There is also a function in our control system that we can simulate them internally in the control system. AC representation in the real-time simulator. Uh, this is something that I would like to push. FST is not a repetition of DPS, dynamic performance studies. We are not doing these studies in the real-time simulator. This is only for verification of the control. You, you can simpl simplify it by saying that in EMT studies, we are testing and contr the control system's impact on the AC network. In FST, it's actually the other way around. How does the AC network affect the control system? And in this part, we can actually simulate anything that happens on the converter bus with a single source in an accurate way to get this feedback we need. We are still doing dynamic testing by AC fault, DC fault, and step responsible of the control. So Hitachi's ha approach is that the AC equivalent is sufficient for the testing done in the FST. It has been so now for more than 30 years, and this has been working extremely well for us. So if you take a look on the comparison between the EMT and real-time simulations, in the non-real-time, we have a software in the loop. We use the MAC control logic, the MAC software, virtual MAC hardware emulation. It can run on any standard PC. Bigger models is plug and play operation. Model design dictates simulation speed. Snapshot function, test can be done out automated. You can test in parallel. You can have several people running several different cases and different computers. You can do it in any time. You are not depending on the hardware. So if you look on the real time there, you have hardware in the loop. Mac control, Mac software, and Mac hardware. This is the real system. It's run, run on real-time simulators. Bigger model requires new hardware, ex extensive engineering work. It's not easy to change the models. Simulation speed is dictated by model design. Any change might give you a problem with the time step in order to do this. There's no really good snapshot functions for testing automated. You need supervision of the testing completely. You can only run one test at a time. It's a serious process that takes a lot of time. It, you can only run it during the project execution stage because that is when you have the hardware before you deliver it. It's done in our factory system too. It, so you have a few engineers doing tests at each test, but you need a lot of experts during the time you do the testing. Drawbacks of real-time simulations. Long time. All testing, as I said, is done in serial activities. Requires several of different experts involved in the testing. So it's a, quite a lot of people involved in all of the testing over quite a long period. You don't have the real signal levels 
in the, in the, from the simulator is all low level voltage. So you have to replace your current measurement boards with voltage boards. So the, the hardware is expensive, can only be run on the real system during project execution. So it means once we have shipped the equipment, we cannot go back and test it unless there's a replica in for this project. So that, but fitting complex model in the real time and maintaining a good time step, that is the real headache. Any changes, any extra fault case added can actually give you a time step overflow. And our approach has also been when we come to VSC that we run everything, the complete system in small time step. That means two and a half to three microseconds. Benefits. There are not many, but the only way to know that you deliver it will work on site has to be done. This is the most important testing we do. This is when we test that the complete system works as a single unit. All communications, all the loads on everything is in limits and we also fulfill the specification. So it is extremely important that we do this. We have no real way to go into a digital world and do this testing. RTS in the future. Simulators probably will get more powerful. <clears throat> you can have larger and more detailed models. Then the question is what do you want to do with it? As we see, our approach has been working. We think that we will get better models, but no larger network needed for us. And on the customer request side, we have seen two things that we really have seen coming in the last year. Internal control system inside real-time simulators. This is something that we would see as a huge problem because in order to facilitate the control system into a real-time simulator, you probably have to change a lot of things in order to get it running. And then the questions arise, what am I testing? Am I testing my solution or am I testing if it could work like this? You do not have control exactly what it is, how you run the code. In the case of replicas, we have seen uh, demands and we also used to have a solution that worked with our old earlier control system, a fully digital interface allowing for IU3 study replicas. This is something that we all probably will go back to in order to be able to provide real-time simulations, but with a smaller footprint, because a replica is quite large. As Sebastian said, they had 200 cubicles, so it's you will have a huge space that is needed for any replicas if you want to have several of them. So thank you from me. Any questions? Perfect. Well, thank you to all the speakers for their great presentations and also for all sticking absolutely to time. So that should give us um, plenty of time for some discussion at the end. So if you do have any questions, um, please do put them in the Q&A and we'll try and address them. Um, but now just ask all the the panelists to, to put their videos on and we can um, start the discussion. So I did have a few questions come in. Uh, slide 13. Uh, one question was, uh, can you explain what hardware is and loop is? So I think that actually came in just before Sebastian's presentation. So ho hopefully that one is now answered since Sebastian went through that um, during his presentation. Uh, now, Matt, has, the, this one came in during your presentation. Uh, the oscillations figure, visible in your figures seem to be around 10 hertz. Uh, if your EMT model does not cover that frequency range, it's not prepared with enough uh, modeling details. And the comparison between the two platforms isn't accurate. Um, do you, would you have any sort of response to that, Matas? Uh, well, 
10 hertz oscillations uh, were previously seen in, in other cases when we ran uh, offline ENT simulations. So they do not, they do not appear particularly in this, uh, in this case, uh, but I'm, I'm, I'm sure that uh, we developed the model for, for that frequency range as well. So um, it, it's, a, it's a valid difference that we presented uh, between offline and RTS simulations. Absolutely. Okay, thank you. Um, so I just want to sort of seed a few general questions because it came across through the presentations that uh, the, the panelists seem to take some different views on things with uh, one side saying the, the real time is great for sort of all simulation because it's quicker and then um, other, other people coming in with, well, actually, no, it's not. But I think some of that's maybe to do with perspective and what you're actually trying to use the, the models to do. So if I could maybe start by asking um, Sebastian to, to maybe weigh in on that and just maybe explain why he maybe sees some of the differences between the different perspectives. Yeah, the, what, yeah obviously the real-time simulation is, um, is a solution to do fast simulation, but in order to, to, to meet the real-time constraint, again, it, it has been explained later, you need to, to, to add a lot of simplifications. And it's not so, you know, with the presentation and, the, and actually the question that has been raised concerning this uh, oscillation at 10 Hertz, um, you have to compare what is comparable, uh, actually. So if you compare real-time simulation with um, offline, you have to compare exactly the same level of detail and the same type of model, for instance. It's similar as you, I can take a, an example. If you want to, to compare um, microwave oven with a classical oven uh, and, you, and, and you cook, you put it in the microwave oven, but in this cake, you put a lot of sugar, fruit and everything. And in the cake, uh, you, 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 you put it in the classical oven, you put no, no sugar and no, no fruit, nothing, and just flour and eggs, for instance. And then you compare the result at the end of the cake uh, cook in the classical oven and the cake cook in the microwave oven. And you say, ah, the one with the microwave oven is, is quite better. So the microwave oven is, is quite better. But no, you, you, you have to compare the same ingredients put in the, in the two <laughs> microwave oven. For sure, the microwave oven will be faster and will give you the, uh, the result faster. But that, that's why it's, it's quite tricky to compare both. Um, they have their own benefits, they have their own limitations, but for sure real-time simulation uh, is not the magic tool that will solve all the um, issues and, and, and say that it's, it's more accurate because you, you use a, small, a smaller time step, it, it's quite dangerous. Uh, because to do this, you need a lot of uh, simplification tricks and so on. For instance, in, in the RT, in, in the real-time simulation, to do very small time step, you need to do to have a um, fixed hamilton matrix solver, for instance, or other simplification, and that has a lot of impacts on your accuracy of the result. So it's um, say both have their own benefits, but it's it. I think it's quite important to to clear uh, to to have clearly um, details and, and, and documenting the, the benefit of real-time simulations, the benefit of EMT simulation offline. Um, and the fact that of real-time simulation with only models, I would say it's uh, obviously you have the, your, your result quite fast, but it, it's, it can be dangerous. It can be dangerous. Thank you. Thank you for the analogy. Although I do not want a cake. <laughs> And then I suppose just building on that, well, just coming to yourself and coming from a TO as well, what, what would be your thought on uh, giving all your power system planners uh, a real-time simulation rack at however much they're going to charge you for that compared to their standalone laptop that they use just now for all your, your offline studies? I suppose that would be another aspect to consider. Yeah, for sure. Sorry, uh, Lord Ritz, sorry, I was, trying to, I was trying to bring you in to, to the question. Oh, sorry, oh. I thought it was uh, Claude Sebastian. Yeah, but definitely uh, 
definitely that would be a challenge. And I can only say it in a Ginet, uh, up until this point today, we've only been using the offline simulations tools, RMS simulation and ENT simulation offline. And we have not been using any, you could say, uh, real-time simulation or hardware in the loop yet. But as I also presented, this is something we are like uh, reconsidering with the energy islands because this is a new special system. But also like Sebastian was pointing out that maybe uh, going to the real time is only uh, like he's saying valid or you could say a good option when you have the real hardware, when you're connecting it to the hardware. So uh, this is back to the whole, one of the things that are interesting to discuss here today is when you're in a feasibility phase, when you don't have all the hardware yet, does it really give you any value? And then again, when you then go into, you could say upgrading an already existing system, you, so you have some hardware from the first system, but you don't have any hardware from the thing you are upgrading into would it then be beneficial? And if I'm listening to Sebastian, what he's saying, it's it's arguable and uh, the real value of the real time is connecting it to the hardware. So I think that's a, a good perspective. And it, it, it seemed to me that Robert, you shared that sort of opinion where the, the real time was only really for that when you're testing the equipment itself, would that be fair to say? Yeah, th that has been our approach for, as I said, 30 years, and it has worked well, both with analog and the real digital real-time simulations. Because you need a system. The, the, if you say you're going to do real-time uh, testing before you have the solution, how will you build a cubicle? How? What should I build it on? What specification should I design my control system? That is uh, the big question. Yeah, and I, I, and I suppose that kind of brings me to the next point I'd like to explore. And so you're saying about 30 years of history um, and it has worked, I've got one through the back. <laughs> but the the point I suppose is the next 30 years is going to look very different. And when you start seeing the, the pictures that Laudritz had in um, his presentation where you start building up the multiple layers in a single scheme, um, how then I suppose, I would ask the question, the question when you start to build on to your second and your third one and maybe you have a more standard control scheme um, because it's a specification that lasts across the multiple generations could you maybe see then having a sort of generic replica that you could bring in because you you have an off-the-shelf specification uh, uh, I mean, I, I've been reading read the specification now for 10 years. And if you give me a standard specification in the future, I would be very happy. I think <laughs> it will be hard. So do I. But <laughs> no, uh, I, I, I don't think we will get there. Uh, that is at least not within uh, 10 to 20 years, because all the TSOs has different demands and different requirements. And also for different solutions. Are we talking wind parks? Are we talking uh, corridor projects? Or are we talking back-to-back -back solutions? Facts, the same. Th there has to be a platform for testing it. And real-time simulation, if you're using the real hardware, of course, then you can protect the code and so on. If you try to move the code into the real-time simulation, then we immediately run into question regarding IP. How do we protect our IP and how do we protect those things? And what can we share? It's not just that we cannot share with our competitors, but we are not even allowed to do such things and cooperate in the full living. So there, there are many questions that has to be solved in those, doing this. Oh, absolutely. That, that's, and I'm sure Sebastian and Laura are so the same, but I spend an awful lot of time on the phone talking about IP and how we can share things and trying to build into the contracts, even getting yeah. some... Uh, decent PSCAD models and whatever, let alone uh, open source controllers. Yes. <laughs> um, and I suppose that kind of brings another thing uh, that I'd like to explore is even when you've got the physical hardware, um, when you're bringing in your, your next project, how how do you manage the, the IP? Say it's, uh, as Laudritz was saying, you want a multi-vendor solution for your, your phases. So I'll maybe come to Laudritz next since I've mentioned you. Say you have your first scheme, you've bought your replica, 
and then you're moving on to your second scheme and you want to um, plug in your, your cubicles for the FST, how, how do you sort of see that developing uh, with the agreements with the manufacturers and, and moving forward? You're yeah, asking a really tricky question that I wish I knew the answer to, but yeah, brother, please. Now, but uh, for us, it's, uh, that is done with the PSCAD and with generic models. Uh, we do not do any multi-in-feed studies right now with the, um, with the real-time simulators. So we have delivered for the Johan Svedrup uh, there, but then it was done by RTE as a third party independently. That is probably the solution that so will continue for a while. So so I suppose the next bit that comes to that then, Robert, is that you you trust your offline PSCAD models implicit, yes. explicitly. Um, yes. And then I suppose you, you've got to trust whatever the client provides you for the existing one. Yeah, uh, we have to do that. I mean, that's the best we have today. But we know that our... our I mean, the, we know that what we have experience of is that our models works with the real system, with the real, uh, the same result as the real life. And that's our experience that we built on. Okay, so I suppose that brings to the sort of next topic and maybe bring Sebastian in on this about um, any differences you've seen between your offline studies and your, your real-time simulations with the, the hardware. Yeah, uh, yeah. Actually, what what, what is good uh, with, with our experience is that we, we are able to achieve a good agreement between real time and offline. But it takes really a lot of time uh, to achieve this good agreement. Uh, first, because you need to be sure that your, uh, for instance, the GDC control protection software is exactly the same in the replica and in the model. Uh, but when it's done, uh, then you need really to work a lot in order to, to be sure that the simplification or, uh, for instance, I, I was talking about the step line you use in the real-time simulator does not impact too much the accuracy of the, uh, uh, of the simulation. But at, uh, actually, where, where are you able, even in the Johan you know, Johan Verhoff, it's two HVDC from two different vendors, two different technologies. You have a large offshore grid. And we, we are able to, to have a very good match between the um, offline and real time. Um, but it's not for some, uh, I would say for some um, application and for, for some test scenario, uh, for instance, when we have this, um, uh, we, we, uh, we have some simplification that are done in the real time simulation with nonlinear element or with the zero sequence impedance as well. Uh, it may happen that no, we know that the replica uh, and the real-time simulation is not valid and will not give you good result for this type of event. For instance, if, if the frequency go a little bit too high, um, it, it will not be valid. And so, uh, but it's, it, it really takes a lot of time and discussion also with um, the JDC vendors uh, that have a good knowledge on the, uh, and un also understanding of the limitation uh, of the modeling in the real-time simulation of their own system. Um, and, and so this is why we, yeah, it, it's, it's difficult to say that, um, uh, and, and to clearly limit the scope of validity of the real-time simulation when you have a project like this. Um, it, it really depends on the level of details and all the simplification you, you did in the real-time simulation. But what is good is that from our experience, when you are in a project, the vendors are able to provide you with the um, very accurate offline models because the, the engineer working on this one, on this project, I, know, I don't think the same, let's say 10 years or 15 years later, it may be tricky because you need to be sure that the, the black box model you have is still uh, you can still run it on a, on a, um, with the operating system you have, with the software you have. It's a little bit more tricky, but when during a project, when you work with the vendor, they are able to provide you with a very accurate model that represents the real 
the real system, including the time delays and even something like a representation of the hardware. Okay, so it's, it sounds like you, you're quite happy to, to mostly trust the, the offline simulation as well, but maybe the, the hardware gives you a wee bit more longevity. Yeah, it, uh, <laughs> it's, uh, again, it's also depend on the quality of the model, of the offline models. Uh, I, I'm just talking about HVDC here. I know that, you know, it, it's not a general statement. It's based on our experience with the, the main vendors on HVDC. They are able to provide good models if you, if you work closely with them and you have a good tracking of the software version that are used on the control protection system. Yeah. Um, uh, I suppose maybe building on the, the experience you had of being the sort of trusted third party, I mean, we've got replicas through the back and I wouldn't fancy trying to um, unplug all that and ship it off to say Denmark for a, a connection going over to Denmark. So how would you sort of suggest, you know, when you are sort of building these schemes up and their uh, in their stages and you end up with, you know, you've got your giant facility in Lyon, Sebastian. Um, if you're trying to integrate into something that's existing in the UK and you've got this, this other one, do, do you need to have multiple sets of replicas that live at wherever people want to do their, their simulations? Or have you, have you got a view on how to manage the, the physical hardware of, of the replicas once you're starting to go cross border? Uh, is the question for me or for Robert? Uh, I, I'll, I'll maybe go to Robert because actually the, the thing that um, struck me from your presentation is it's the performance guarantee tests. And the, the thing I wanted to sort of dig into there is if in a specification that you get from a client, they say, thou shalt do your testing with our existing replicas. How does that sort of build into the performance guarantee test? Or if you've not done it, how, how would you see that working in? I have not seen any request for testing with the existing replicas so far, actually. Uh, we have done, uh, we actually, we have done it uh, one in the CMS project. Yeah, well, <laughs> I'm, I'm glad you caught that because, yeah, I was, I was say, yeah, that's what I'm doing in it next. So. <laughs> yeah, but, uh, but, but there we are. That was special because there we actually had the three station built in the beginning of the project. The yeah. third one was delivered now. I think it has been delivered to you. I'm a correct one. So, hey, we but, have all the replicas I mean, and Shetland's on the construction. Yeah. 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 So, I mean, th th that is the only time we have had this request, so to speak. <laughs> so, I don't see it happening as a standard because, as we see, there, there are three large. Uh, user of replicas. There's uh, RTE, it's you in Glasgow, and then we have Hydro Quebec. Those are the three major players that ask and request replicas in tenders. So I suppose this is maybe an unfair question, and I'm thinking of the next thing that comes along because uh, CMS was designed as actually a five terminal scheme. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So say the, the fourth terminal turns out to be. Siemens and it happens to be going to Denmark and it's it's Laudritz that's running it. Uh, maybe maybe Robert, because I've been asking you a lot of questions, I'll maybe take <laughs> Laudritz's view on this first. <laughs> like how, how would you see that going? If, if you know we've got a replica of the far end of what you're plugging into, how, how would you see yourself sort of specifying that and asking for replicas or getting the, the actual system cubicles brought over to, to, to try it all? together or is that not a question you've you've thought of yet yeah so um, i think just to before i start answering and talking a lot is that this is one of the open questions right now why yeah. how do we deal with this and how should we deal with it and we don't have the perfect answer but i think based on what rob is, is saying they have not delivered this to many systems yet and this is exactly what i wanted to express with my presentation also is I think we are looking into something new now, these new offshore systems. And this is why we are asking at least at Inginet, is this a game changer, at least for the first hops? And we are talking about the North Sea wind power hop and using real-time simulation to de-risk here. 
do we need to do something differently and how and how do we do it? At least in, in Aginet, I can say that we are really considering uh, should we buy replicas and uh, have these re replicas available to do control interaction studies with uh, in a multi-vendor environment? Uh, is this something we need? And this is the open question right now. Uh, and I, I cannot give an answer here. And then, Ian, the, the thing you're hinting at is, is how do we do it then in practice? Uh, is it, uh, how do we do it across countries with uh, different laboratories and how uh, this is really tricky to answer. But I, I think everything begins with, uh, is it needed? And then we can figure out, uh, um, figure out how to do it. Uh, that is a matter of the, all the practicalities. But from an electrotechnical point of view, theoretical point of view, uh, the question is, is it needed? And I think Sebastian has been giving some good, you could say, you, can, you need both. Uh, there are pros and cons. And that is also why in the end, it, it becomes a tricky, a, a tricky decision <laughs> to we need it. And uh, I, I think... Uh, I think that that's what we are going to see here in the in the future years with the development in the North Sea and around the world with these new type of really large uh, systems in in weak grids and zero inertia and all of this. So uh, the, the, that that's the point of view. Uh, and I I think uh, without just guessing, I think that Robert <laughs> will maybe see more of this, even though he says he has not delivered many. I think that uh, that is uh, potentially come to change. That's the joy of being the moderator is I get to ask the question and I was uh, trying to steal a few answers for myself, as you can tell. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, that, that's kind of the point I was, I was trying to get to as well as, you know, 30 years it's worked, but the future 30 years looks very different when you see like the, the work that's going on here, the coordinated offshore we're talking about in the UK. And uh, yeah, you see other people getting in touch with ourselves and I'm sure others talking about how to set up their own real-time testing facility. So it seems to be the, the, the way of the world. Um, so I'll maybe come back to some more uh, specific questions. And sorry, I'll, I'll start with Matas maybe because I'm afraid I've, I've been quite quiet at drawing you in. So I'll, I'll jump up to some questions for you. Uh, so maybe I'll get you to weigh in first on how do you deal with the system equivalencing. Um, so this is obviously one, one of the key things for when you're going to the, the real-time systems is you do have this hardware limitation and you, you've got to draw a line somewhere on your AC system. So I was just wondering in the, the testing that you've done, um, how detailed uh, AC system equivalent did you use and did you, did you find any issues with that? Uh, so, uh, as I presented the case, it's it's quite uh, isolated and, and quite small case. So, uh, the wind power parks are represented using uh, the um, converter interface. So, we model just, just converter interface and we represent them as equivalents. On the onshore grids, uh, since the HVDC links are connecting to a, a strong grid, continental Europe, we have represented them uh, with... Um, uh, AC sources uh, in, uh, behind the impedance. So, so far, uh, we have not uh, ex experienced, experienced uh, any, any interaction between that. And um, from what I understand, um, in some cases, uh, yeah, uh, as Robert mentioned, he, they, they do it as well. So I think it's, it's a valid approach. Yeah, I'm, I'm jealous of the continental European short circuit levels. Let's let's put it that way. Yeah. Oh, I wonder maybe if uh, Sebastian would have anything to say on the AC system equivalencing for for real time. Uh, yeah, <laughs> I don't know. It, it it really depends on the application and on the on, on the. Uh, let's say the, the the test and the phenomena you would like to to analyze. Um, the AC system equivalent. Most of our replica, for most of our replica, the, the AC system is represented with the Tevna equivalent. So very simple representation. But for some um, uh, scenario and phenomena, we would like to analyze, especially when you have, for instance, um, mechanical oscillation or, or, or low transient. 
phenomena for which we need to uh, model some inertia on the on the grid side. Uh, the simple Thévenin equivalent cannot uh, be sufficient. Or, for instance, when you need to energize a transformer and you have an interaction with the the grid um, or harmonic interaction, for instance, you need a. That doesn't mean that you need a very large scale network. You can do a reduced one, uh, but every time you need to you you do a, a study, you need you need to adapt your model. So the AC equivalent most of the time is it's okay for the dynamic test we perform, but sometimes you need to to have a more uh, specific model uh, in order to answer the, the need. And this is not specific to real time simulation. It's, it, it's, it's, this is true for any type of simulation tool you use. Um, and there is no, uh, there is not only one answer to this. It's, it's really depend on the, on the, on the, on the, on the study you have to conduct and you need to adapt the AC grid model to the, the, the need and the, and the type of study you, you would like to, to do. Yeah. I suppose it, it, it's just understanding where, where the boundaries are and the other challenge, I suppose, is also getting that information yourself is to... Uh, yeah. <laughs> not not it's an easy a, task. It, yeah, obviously, but it, it's, it, it's also with the real-time simulation, what is good is that you need to restrict yourself for sure because you, you cannot model or you can model very large grid, but that will cost you a lot of money. For sure, and you will add the uh, racks and CPU and so on. So it's feasible, um, but I don't think it's relevant <laughs> and it's useless to do it. Um, so you need to to be uh, yeah clever and, um, and and do a reduction that will fit to your needs. That's that's uh, that's normal. But you are more forced to do this for real time simulation because you you have very limited capabilities at the end. Dep depends where you are, I suppose. But yeah, even with that, I'm uh, eating it up. <laughs> yeah, but even with this, I'm sure that I can provide you with grid that you cannot that cannot fit into this. Oh yeah, easily. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's always <laughs> the same because even if you double your your number of rack and computer, you will every time find somebody else who will ah yeah I want to do this interaction study with all the, the generators. And are you sure that if I model this generator? Um, yeah. Five kilometers around that that uh, that will not have an impact. I uh, say, so, yeah, I have to test and so discuss. It's yeah. there is no limit actually. There's always and this is not complexity. this is not the same with offline. Again, this with offline, it's a question of simulation time at the end. Um, it, it's and even if for some reason you you double your time of simulation, it, it can be okay because if you wait not. 20 minutes, but for 40 minutes, at least you have an answer. For real-time simulation, it will not run at all. You cannot run, or you can purchase additional hardware. It's... Yeah, yeah, yeah. And done enough offline simulations you set up to run over the weekend, and you hope you've got some answers by the time you come oh. back in on Monday. Yeah. yeah, at least you have an answer. <laughs> yeah. And then um, with these... Uh, what is it 36 core solutions or whatever you can do with uh, some of the, the offline tools that, that speeds up a little so uh, Ian, i know you're the one asking the questions but now i'm daring to ask one because we have talked <laughs> yeah, a lot about simulation speed but i would like to just open up a bit about the accuracy because mm -hmm. at least and again we don't have experience with the real time and hardware in the loop at Inikinet. But to my understanding, when you're working in projects where you have both EMT models, and this is also for Robert actually, when you have the EMT model and then you do your hardware testing, to my understanding, it should also be possible that or I, have, I have heard <laughs> at least that you often can update your EMT models several times and make them more and more accurate due to doing the hardware testing where you learn what details did you not include, what was not modeled accurately. And Robert, you were showing this really nice diagram where you um, do all your studies in the offline environment and, uh, and test the controls and update the controls. And then you go to a lab setup. But does it never happen that you can, you also have an iteration from the lab back to your EMT models where you find that 
the EMT models could not represent what you tested in the laboratory? No, it's more like we get the feedback normally on changing of the code when we are out, when we do testing on this update of that part. I mean, the hardware representation in the EMT, the EMT model we use has been, I mean, that has been tested already. And normally when we provide the EMT model for customer, there are one, there are several deliveries. The, and the final is after commissioning and handover, then, then the last update of whatever has been found on site with the code changes in that one is delivered to the customer. But of course, there are always ongoing studies, so to speak, during the project. There might be that we haven't finished the study, so we find something that we have to update. So, so I mean, mm -hmm. there are updates, but not, not directly on the hardware side, I would say that that de depending on hardware. Yeah. And my hypothesis would be that now when we're going into this more future hybrid systems, which are modularly expanded, that when we, we there's a risk that we will see some interaction in some studies. Uh, but or that we could represent these studies on the uh, I mean re-represent re these control interaction on the con on the control and protection replica if we have one but we could not see it maybe in the EMT model because the EMT model is missing some detail or missing some function what is your view on that? Uh, uh, no because what do you mean missing in the functionality? I mean... It could be something uh, that was inaccurate, a time delay, or it could be a, a special protection function that was not included in the initial uh, EMT model. I mean, the, I mean, of course you have to change whatever is wrong, but that should be... A, I, I think that you will have the same risk the other way around, that you have to update your real-time system as well as the software. I mean, this is both way, if you miss anything. Mm -hmm. This is not, not special for real-time or offline. The, the, it's the same chance that you have it wrong in the real-time as in the offline, if you mean like that. But mm -hmm. that's why you have this one going back and forth when you do the testing yeah. in the beginning. Yes, but my, my point would be that maybe you saw this risk if you had your replica uh, hardware in the loop set up and did some testing uh, connected to a neighboring system or whatever before you did t try it on site, real life, offshore, and you could not see this as in your EMT model, for example. That would be my hypothesis. Yeah, but if you have it, I mean, how can we do this testing real time if we don't have the real control system uh, interaction studies? De de that is definitely an interaction study should be either run as, then you have to do it like a third party study or mm -hmm. you have to do it offline where we actually can deliver a model that we know is protected and also works for yeah. for, for the customer to test. So so this is, this is a, a little area that has to be clarified among all suppliers and TSOs, how do we handle these things? Mm -hmm. Thank you. And sorry, Ian, for- No, absolutely, go <laughs> I think the challenge for the TSOs is for sometimes for these things is we don't know we want them included in the model until it happens. Whereas, you know, with a replica, it's just, it's there, it's inherent because we have the exactly. thing. It's, certainly exactly. that was part of our justification. Um, so. Uh, so I'm sort of conscious of time. So just, want to come back to the, the vicious cycle that you were talking about earlier, Loritz, and just if you've got any views on how, how to break that vicious cycle um, that you were talking about in your presentation. Yeah, so I think what, uh, maybe this is not news to everybody, but I think uh, there's a lot going on between TSOs, between the vendors, uh, and also different uh, knowledge institutions that in Europe, we really have to go together and, uh, and make a large effort to start uh, working on some standards and some standard methodology on how do we de-risk multi-vendor systems. This is a common European challenge and something we need to solve uh, commonly in Europe to try and break this vicious cycle. But I, I think the vicious cycle will never go away 
And uh, this is part of our engineering job that always we will have this dilemma between the owners who have to specify system and then Robert representing the, the vendors who has to uh, develop something according to the specifications. And it will always be kind of this chicken and the egg, but we need to learn how to, uh, to, to deal with that uh, and, and through dialogue and working together figuring out what, what do system operators and also system owners in total, it's not only system operators, but just also developers of offshore wind and so on. What, what do we really wish for and what can the, what can the vendors then target after uh, and then work together? So this is again, one of the tough ones that I don't have a perfect answer, but I think the answer is cooperation between countries and institutions. Yeah, agreed. Absolutely. So, with one minute to go until the the end, so as I'd like to give Mathas just a wee minute just to say if he's uh, got any sort of key findings to take from uh, his studies that he could maybe help us break some of these vicious cycles or anything to weigh in, and just if he's got any closing comments about the uh, upcoming other webinars and the event at the end, if he'd like to finish on any of those. Um. Oh well, well. So uh, it's it's uh, quite a heavy discussion, right? Uh, <laughs> uh, about the vicious cycle, it's uh, for me it's interesting. Um, uh, yeah, to, uh, we haven't touched actually that question, but uh, how we specify the uh, requirements for for these kind of systems where we haven't had them before. Uh, I mean, zero inertia systems and. Um, I think um, from academia's perspective, we, we do see that uh, real-time simulations could could be could be used uh, for, for this specific for this specific part. Um, regarding the um, the the other webinars, uh, so yeah, we will have uh, we have a webinar series. So there are two webinars left. Uh, one is on Thursday, uh, and another one will be on October fourth. So uh, you're welcome to, to attend that. And um, yeah. So, well, that's, that's the end of our scheduled time. So I'd just like to thank everyone for attending and thank all the speakers for their great presentations. And I, I hope those listening enjoyed it, but I thoroughly enjoy getting to pick uh, the people on the call's brains about some, some of these thorny questions that I wrestle with myself and uh, get, so, get some other opinions. I'm sorry, Robert was the only manufacturer on the call because I, I feel like at some point the TSOs ganged up on you a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. But, uh, yeah. Thank you all. And, uh, thank, you. Yep. thank you. Thank you. Thank you.